right, well, good evening. I was told I'm supposed to look up whenever I address a crowd. So good evening. Uh, all right, grab your Bibles, open them to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. As y'all know, we've been working through the book of Romans, and uh, we'll continue on. And look, let me just go ahead and say from the get-go this evening, uh, two, not two Wednesdays ago, we had one off for the, the break, but um, when we covered chapter 9, um, that went really long, and I think I lost some of you. That was like a 50-minute sermon. Y'all know I typically go 25 minutes approximately, and usually I try and end it about there. Uh, that one's just on me. I don't know. I tried to fit too much into one message. It was really long, and then last week I thought, all right, this is much better. And I didn't realize until later when I went through to get the video uploaded that it was 40 minutes, still kind of long. We're going to cover some ground a little bit quicker tonight, though. That is the plan. So Romans chapter 11, we're not going to cover the whole chapter, but we are going to cover a decent little bit of it. Um, and this chapter gets a little tricky, especially when dealing with youth ministry. Um, one of the big political things now that you'll see a lot of people talk about on the two different sides, two main different sides of the aisle, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, is their view of Israel. Typically, you're more conservative, the Republican crowd. They're very much pro-Israel. Uh, they're an ally of ours. We like them. We want to help them. And typically, those who are on the other side of the aisle aren't quite as friendly to Israel. A lot of that is connected through God's Word. This is the reason you see a lot of people that are more likely to be uh, a part of a more conservative uh, kind of viewpoint, more Christian, more Bible-based viewpoint, being more friendly to Israel. And so what 11 really gets at is kind of the view and the plan for ethnic Israel. And it, it can get a little bit tricky, especially when you get in church life. There's a few different camps on where that take different positions on Israel. And that's what we're going to get at tonight. But I want to ask you all this. Just hang in there because I, I really think we've got some very practical ways that we can take what God is teaching us through his word about the nation of Israel, ethnic Israel, and his plan for them, and make it very practical for our day-to-day -day lives. So just hang in there. But uh, in chapter 9, God talks about God's sovereign choice in regards to his plan of salvation. And we said at the beginning of chapter 9 how Paul starts with that question. He's saying, what then? Has God's word failed? Because he's sitting there preaching and it's like, well, if he really came to save these people and these people aren't even believing in him, did God just fail? Did he mess up? And so Paul launches into the ninth chapter, which, as I'd said then, is the most debated chapter probably in all of Scripture uh, where he's saying it's God's choice according to his election. God picks, God chooses. You can take it to the bank that God's plan is going to happen because God is God. And you're not going to sway his hand. He has his choice. And then you get to chapter 10 that we covered last week. And chapter 10 comes along talking about how Paul's desires for everyone to be saved. He wants these people to know Christ. He wants them to call upon the name of the Lord. But in chapter 10 he goes through and says, but how are they going to call on the name of the Lord if they don't believe? And how are they going to believe if they don't hear? And how are they going to hear? How are they going to hear if no one preaches? And how are they going to preach if no one is sent? And he gives this whole argument. And then he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? How awesome is it when we're the ones who go out and proclaim the gospel? And that's our duty. That's our duty to bring the gospel to every creature and so we saw that in chapter 10, and now chapter 11 comes in, and he looks more specifically at kind of the mix of Jew and Gentile. So let me make it really simple. You're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. Uh, no one say, oh, me, I'm an American. That's what I am. You're a Gentile. That's what you are, because you're not a Jew. There were Jews, there were Gentiles. We're the Gentiles, unless someone in here is Jewish that I do not know of. You are a Gentile. And so Paul comes in, and here's how he starts chapter 11. Y'all look, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Paul starts in chapter 11, verses one, he, verse 1, he says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. 
For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. All right, so there's a bit there just in the first few verses. But quickly, verse 1, he states that question. I asked then, has God rejected his people? He's asking these questions like, Posing this this person who would take issue with what he's teaching. So has God rejected his people, Israel? Are they done with? The final plan is over for them? And then the answer says, by no means. And then he gives his reason. He says, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. This is basically Paul saying, okay, so do you think God failed in this? Is God done with Israel? Look at me. I I am an Israelite, and I'm here preaching to you. Clearly, it didn't fail finally and all the way. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I am an Israelite. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. He uses himself as his own example. I'm right here before your eyes. So clearly, God is not through with Israel altogether. He's literal proof that God did not do it. And you even think about... What all Paul goes into, he specifies that he's from Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. He was so much so a Jew that he was persecuting the church. Keep in mind, he was there at Stephen's death, giving approval, saying, kill him. Kill him because he professes faith in Christ. Now here he is professing faith in Christ for everyone. That's the radical change that took place. So clearly God was not through with that Jew. He uses himself as the first Example, and then in verse 4, he goes to Scripture as an example. It says, not just me, but even think back in the Old Testament. Think about Elijah, and that's where he brings up Elijah. And he, he said, do you not know what Scripture says of Elijah and how he appeals to God against Israel? And in verse 3, here's what Elijah said in the Old Testament. Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. Elijah felt like it is all over with. Let me give you a a brief kind of story of what happened with Elijah in the Old Testament and what led him to go before God and say, hey, they've killed everybody. I'm by myself. I'm all alone. Here's what got him to that point. Israel as a nation had turned their back on God. Elijah is a prophet sent by God to speak to his people. He's over there preaching to them. They're not listening. Well, they end up having a big showdown on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. And they're saying, our God is real. And Elijah's saying, oh, my God, the one true God, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel, that, that is the one true God. So they said, okay, well, let's go up here. And they kind of had this challenge where they said, we're going to build an altar and pile all this wood up, and I will, we will call to our gods, and he will light it on fire and consume it. So said, okay. So they did. They made their altar. And it's really a, an interesting story. We even see where they were mocking their God maybe, and said, maybe your God's taking a nap. Maybe your God had a long day today, and he's kind of like taking it easy. Maybe that's why your God isn't consuming it, but nothing ever happened. This false pagan God of Baal, they build their altar and all their wood, and nothing never happened. Then Elijah comes up and says, I got you. So he builds his altar, not just builds it, but he he pours, douses it in water, makes it to where it would be impossible just about. And when he cries out to God, God comes down and lights it and burns it. Well, of course, they turn against him. So he's fleeing. And then we have the story of Jezebel. And Jezebel was in power. She hated Elijah. She wanted him dead. We even have a story in there where he had to outrun a chariot. Uh, most historians believe about 18 miles that Elijah ran. Supernatural strength and speed and endurance from God where he outran a chariot for 18 miles. Mr. Bruce texted me today and a picture, a screenshot of his workout, his run today, and his average pace. And uh, not dogging Mr. Bruce, because he can run faster than I can if he's running three miles.
but he ain't outrunning a chariot, right? None of us are going to outrun a chariot. You're talking about horses. There's a reason we call things uh, powerful. We say, how much horsepower did they have? You know, there's horses on a chariot. Elijah outruns them. He ends up getting off into the wilderness and hiding because he's all alone. They've killed all the prophets before him, and he said, they're coming to kill me. This is a hopeless endeavor. None of them are going to be saved. This is not working clearly. That's why in verse 3, he says, Lord, they have killed your prophets. They've demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But notice what God said in verse 4. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now I know some of this stuff gets a little in-depth, a little philosophical, can get a little controversial. It's hard to make a controversy out of that. God literally says, I kept 7,000 people for myself. They did not bow their knee to Baal. So when Elijah thought he was all alone and by himself, what we see in God's word is no, there's actually 7,000 people followers, believers in the true God that are out there. You just haven't run across them. And so here's what I would tell you today. You may feel alone oftentimes in your faith. You may find yourself in a crowd, in a situation, in a club, on a ball team, wherever it may be, maybe even in home life, where you look around and think, no one else is following after Christ. I'm by myself. No one else cares. No one else is worried about it. Think back on Elijah, who was literally running for his life, and God assuring him, you're not alone, brother, I promise you. There are 7,000 people that I've kept for myself. Don't ever think you're all by yourself in your faith. God has his remnant. He has his people. Our call is to be faithful to the mission at hand and continue on. And so, despite the frustration that Elijah felt, or the frustrations that Paul felt, or the frustrations that we may feel about a lack of believers around us, God has his remnant still. They're there. He moves on in verses 7 through 10. That's what Paul writes. He says, What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Now, we see again Paul bringing up something that's already been mentioned in chapter 9 uh, in regards to hardening. If you remember chapter 9, Paul goes on and talks about Pharaoh and how his heart was hardened. And if you read through that story in the Old Testament, what's interesting is Pharaoh hardened his own heart first. Then God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But the application, the point that God makes in Romans 9 is the potter has right over the clay to do what he wishes with it. The potter shapes and makes some vessels for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. And so Pharaoh hardened his heart. He was rebelling against God, and so God said, okay. And he used him for dishonorable use. Now he's saying Israel, because of their rejection of him, their sin, their ungodliness, they have been hardened. We see that same type of hardening happening to Israel. He's saying that's the reason you don't see all of Israel turning to me and having faith in me. That's the reason you feel like you're all by yourself. That's the reason you feel like you're on your own. And so it's that kind of dance that I've mentioned already between the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. Is God the potter? Can he do what he wants with the clay? Yes. There's no denying it. It is plainly written in Scripture. But are you responsible for how you respond to God? Absolutely. The Bible is clear that we must turn to him and trust in him. The responsibility lies on us, Israel, Pharaoh turned against God. God used him as a vessel of wrath. He used him as an example of, of his wrath. Israel turned their back on him, killed the Messiah, killed the prophets, killed the Christ of God. So they've been hardened. 
That's what we see happening. Don't forget what Paul actually said in chapter 9, where he says that he's the potter and we are the clay, and that we have no right to say, well, why did the potter make me this way? He made you that way because of your rejection of him and your unbelief. And that's it. It's as plain and as simple as that. I would also remind you that he said there in Romans 9, when he talks about that, he endured with much patience the vessels of wrath. So he endured with much patience. Israel rejected him, killed the Messiah. Now they've been hardened. And so he moves on in verse 11. Let's look at verse 11 in chapter 11. He says, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles as to make Israel jealous. Now stop and think about what he said here. Did they stumble that they might fall? We've all seen the person who we've seen it here on Sunday night several times, especially playing death ball. Somebody's running, and what do we want to do? Stick a foot out and trip them. Why don't we trip people when they're running? Or if we're sitting in a circle and everybody's excited playing the game and they go to sit down and the person next to them slides a chair out and they just crash on the ground, everybody's laughing. So why do we do that? It's funny. It's funny. We laugh. It's funny to see someone fall. We all giggle about it and we laugh about it. Paul essentially is saying, so I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Like, what's the purpose? Why would you do that? Why would you watch them trip, stumble, and fall like that? Why? Is it for pleasure? Do you, do you just get a kick out of it? Like, why would God do that? I know why us as sinful people, I know why I like to see you fall on the ground because it makes me laugh. It's funny. You're not really getting hurt. But Israel, we're talking about rejecting God the Son and being hardened against him to where they will die in their unbelief. Why does that happen? Is that a good thing? He answers and says, by no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. In other words, through their rejection, God has used that to bring the gospel to you. Keep in mind, we're talking about a Jewish God, we're talking about a Jewish Messiah Jewish scriptures, a Jewish place, Jewish temple, not American, not a Gentile Messiah, Gentile anything. We believe in their scriptures, their Messiah. He did that. That took place so that we could be brought in, so that we could have salvation. And he says to make Israel jealous. Now, we could spend time here. I'm not going to camp out there too long. I think we all know and could think of a situation of jealousy, especially as teenagers. Maybe you wish you were as popular or as good-looking as someone else. Maybe you wish you had that boyfriend or girlfriend. When you get older, you may wish you had the money someone has, the car they have, the house they have, the job they have. There, there's always things that entice us to want to be jealous of someone else. They just seem like they have it all together. And we view that, that we know that's a bad thing, but this is a godly jealousy. And, and you read about that in Scripture, even how God is jealous for us, Scripture tells us. But here he says that they've been hardened and the Gentiles have been brought in, and the whole reason is to make Israel jealous. It's to make them jealous and bring them back to salvation. We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's look at verse 12. Verse 12, it says, Now if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So what Paul is saying, if, if, if through their trespass salvation came to all of us, and that's such a glorious, awesome thing, how much greater is it going to be when they get brought back in too and they're not rejecting? Now we don't reject the Messiah, and they don't, we all come together around the Messiah Think of how amazing that will be. I think of, I don't know how many of you were here last year around Easter when we did the Passover Seder. We had the people from Chosen People Ministries come in and lead a Passover Seder. It was all the weird food that did not taste good. I agree with you. It was some weird food. It was odd, but we had that Passover Seder. 
It was amazing to see all the symbolism with everything that they do and how it ties into Scripture and to the Messiah. And we partook in that with them as an example of, of how God has set all of this up. And it's just, it's just so clear in their tradition. And yet they reject him. But you think of when they're brought back in with all the history. They're the ones who got the law, the prophets, everything, the covenants, the blessings, all that was sent to them. Once they're brought back in, think of how awesome our faith will be when we're united with a bunch of Jews. That it's their scriptures, their stuff. He's saying it's going to be incredible. And so verses 13 through 16, 13 through 16, he says, Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles, to us. He says, Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. His point here, using this dough and these branches, I mean, if, if, if a piece can be pinched off and it's good, obviously the whole bit is good, right? That's a pretty simple point he's making. Look, we just had the ice cream truck here Sunday night. If somebody gave you a spoonful of cherry snowball and you ate it and said, that's an amazing cherry snowball, obviously the cup full of cherry snowball that spoonful came from is also good cherry snowball, right? Because it came from that. He's saying the same thing here. Clearly God's people, there, there's a, a, a holy aspect. A, there's something really good about them. If we can just be pulled out of that, that, that remnant, if that can be used and that is something good and holy, well, then clearly the rest of it is as well. Clearly the rest is. Look, let's get on to the grafting, maybe to make a little more sense. In verse 17, he says, But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. All right, Paul used this analogy of grafting. Anybody know just by chance what grafting is? Any youth know? We got two youth. All right. Here's what grafting is. So if you go to Israel, if you go, you could just Google and look at some of these olive trees. They grow to be really big and get really, really old. Well, the way trees and stuff work is all the nutrients, everything comes from the root system to feed the tree. Well, when these trees get really big and old, many times they'll have branches that do not produce fruit anymore. You have branches that die. My front yard is loaded with big, gigantic trees. And any time the wind blows, you got to go up there and pick up, you got to go out there and pick up limbs. You know why? Some of the branches die over time and they fall. And you got to go pick them up and move them. What he's saying, you got that big olive tree. What they would do back then, they would find those dead branches. They'd cut them off. And not just do you cut them off, you cut them off. And then you cut like a little slit out in the tree. Then you go take a young olive tree, a small olive tree, that it's not well established, you cut a branch off of it and you go stick it into that olive tree and you keep it in there and it will attach itself to that main tree and feed, be fed off of the nutrients of that root system and grow in. It's what they call grafting. That's how you get all the odd kind of fruits where people get an orange and a lemon tree and you graft them together and you get this crazy fruit that's a sour orange type. Stuff. You can see a lot of wild stuff out there people have done through grafting. I had a tree in my yard. It didn't make it. Uh, one of those freezes here last year killed it. But I had two different types of camellia trees that the people that had the house for us grafted together. And it would produce one tree, two different types of flowers, camellia flowers. And it was really a cool tree until it snapped off and died. But one neat thing, when they would do that with these olive trees, there's a bunch of different types of olives. It didn't even matter what type. The tree could be one type, and you could graft a branch off a complete different type of olive tree, put it in there, and it would take and be fed all through. He's saying that's what you are as Gentiles. This is a Jewish faith. They were given the covenants, the promises, the blessings, all the prophets, the Messiah, all that came to them. That's the root system. Jewish scriptures, it's all there. You, me, as Gentiles, we were the ones grafted in. And put into that tree. We're not the ones that feed that root. 
that root is what feeds us. So this is Paul saying, don't be arrogant, don't be cocky, saying, oh, well, the Jews don't even believe. We do. This is us. This is ours. We have completely replaced Israel. This is us now. He's saying, no, 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 no. Don't think that for a second. He goes on. In 17, uh, let's see, I just read 17 through 24. Do it. No, I'd stop right before that. Man, I lost my spot. All right, 19 through 24. I'm sorry, not 17. Here's what he says. Then you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Look, he's saying don't be arrogant, don't be boastful. Don't think, ha, I'm not like these unbelieving Jews. I believe. He's saying, yeah, but if you reject God, you'll be cut off just like they were cut off and hardened. They're the natural branches. You're the, the different thing that's been grafted in. Don't get cocky. Paul warns us not to be boastful about our salvation because we're not the natural branches. So how do we make sense out of all of this? Natural branches, not natural. Jews, Gentiles. Is God through with Israel? Is he not through? What is the whole deal with He's going to make them jealous because we believe. I think a good way to paint this picture is by talking about a little boy named Charlie. So Charlie was a Jewish boy. Grew up in an Orthodox Jewish home, early 1900s. He went to a Jewish school, and he was an Orthodox Jew. Rejected Jesus. Did not believe in Jesus to be the Messiah. Completely rejected him. And if you know, Jews do not work or do anything on the Sabbath, right? They, they believe very firmly in that. So what they had is a Sabbath Gentile. And I didn't even know what a Sabbath Gentile was till here, till then. But they would hire Gentiles to come in and basically wait on them on the Sabbath since they couldn't actually work. And they had a lady. And this woman was their Sabbath Gentile. She came in every Sabbath, and she had to cook and clean the house for this boy, Charlie, and his family. That was her job. However, here's what makes the story really interesting. She wasn't just looking for money. She wasn't just looking for a paycheck. She was a missionary sent to reach the Jews. She did that just so that she could be around them. Now, she went and served them, cooked for them, cleaned the house for them, did all of those things for them. And after a while, this little boy, Charlie, starts asking her, you're a Christian? So what do you believe? And she began to open up and share her faith with him. Through the work of this lady, who really was serving as a missionary, coupled with some people from none other than what we just mentioned, Chosen People Ministries. He turned from Orthodox Judaism, gave his life to Christ. He got saved. He went on to, to, to get an extensive theological education. He ended up becoming the dean of Talbot Theological Seminary. He was on staff for years at Dallas Theological Seminary. He has written... Just, I mean, a ton of books. He was an Old Testament Jewish professor. He was just brilliant. Most people, you can look at a lot of your big high up people in, in kind of the Christian academic world now, and he's hailed as one of the greatest American scholars 
that we've had in the last hundred years, Dr. Charles L. Feinberg. And all that came from this little Sabbath Gentile who was hired to simply live out her faith and serve them in an effort to reach them. Something interesting, one of his students, once he got into teaching seminary after he got saved, y'all may recognize the name, one of his students that he took on kind of under his wing and one-on-one, uh, one-on-one discipled was a guy by the name of John F. MacArthur, Jr. Johnny Mac, McCall. I quote Johnny Mac all the time. I've got 50-plus books of his in my library. A lot of people would say one of the greatest expositors of the last 100 years. He was a disciple of Charles Feinberg who came to know the Lord because this woman went into that house and lived out her faith. And just like we read in our passage tonight, and as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. So here's what I want to close with asking you. This lady's goal was to make them jealous for salvation with how she lived out the gospel. Paul's goal was to make them jealous for salvation with how they live out the gospel. How do we live out our faith? How do you live out your faith? If you go to school with a Jewish person or any unbeliever, do they look at you and how you live out your faith and say, man, I want what they have. I don't know what's different about them, but I want that. Do we have the kind of faith and the kind of walk with the Lord to where others would see us and say, I need that. Tell me, what what do you do? What do you believe? Because that was the goal with Scripture. That was God's goal. Not just that lady's goal, not just Paul's goal. That was God's goal. He said, they've been hardened. I brought the Gentiles in to make them jealous so that they may turn and be saved. Think about how you live out your faith. Think about how you do that. And think about how you might play an impact on someone else who may then go about and lead to someone else. Just think how that can branch off and how much could be grafted in. And let's do our part to further the kingdom of God with how we live out our faith. Let's pray, and then we're going to go to small groups uh, afterwards. So, Let's pray and then you can go to your small groups.